Welcome to the Israel Bible Podcast. My name is Cindy Parker, and I am an author, a speaker, and a professor of Holy Land Studies at the Israel Bible Center. I am passionate about reading the Bible in the physical, historical, and cultural context of its day. And I really love having geeky conversations with people about new things. In this podcast, I'd like to invite you to join me as I sit down each week with other faculty members of IBC to discover new aspects of the Bible. These are some of my favorite dialogues because as a modern audience reading an ancient text, we know that the Bible does not need to be rewritten, but it needs to be reread. This week, I'm doing something new on the podcast by bringing in voices outside of our faculty at IBC. In the past three weeks, we've been talking about Professor Shear's course about Paul. Well, at Israel Bible Center, along with all the amazing courses that we have, we offer roundtable talks, which are conversations with cutting edge authors from around the world. Back in 2020, Dr. Ellie Liesorkin Eisenberg interviewed Professor Paula Fredrickson. She has an astounding background. She's the Oriello Professor of Scripture Emerita at Boston University and the Distinguished Visiting Professor of Comparative Religion at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. She has two, two honorary doctorates, and has published several award-winning books. In this roundtable talk, Professor Fredrickson discussed the culture and religious environment in which the early Christ-following movement developed. This is such a perfect complement to what we've been talking about these last few weeks. We don't have time to listen to the whole roundtable talk, but I want to highlight a few interesting snippets. We're going to start with discussing the religious environment in the Roman world during the first century, specifically what it means to offer sacrifices to gods. What a sacrifice does in antiquity, and it does this in the Jerusalem temple as well as in the temple at Delos, a sacrifice calls the god down to the altar. So if the sacrifice is being done around an altar, there is a presence. And any god is bigger than any human. The correct attitude toward a god is of a certain kind of respect. And the Jews' own sacred texts talk about the existence of these other gods. God is not the only god, even in his own book. God says he's yeah. going to go down to Egypt and and smite the gods of the Egyptians, yeah. right? I mean, the Bible is full of other gods. For ancient Jews, is that their god is the supreme god. I certainly knew that other lower gods existed. This understanding was not unique to the first century. You may remember a conversation I had with Dr. Yeshaya Gruber several months ago. We were talking about the name of the Israelite god, and Dr. Gruber said... If you think about the world of the ancient Near East, or in fact, the ancient world in general, people often associated a particular God with a particular land and a yeah. particular people. And the Bible is no different in this respect from other ancient texts. It actually specifies a particular land, Canaan, later Israel, that has a particular God who has particular rules, just like all the other gods did, ways that people have to live in that land to be his people and to be acceptable to him. The plot twist here. Yes. I love that, a good plot twist. Yes. <laughs> the plot twist is that this particular God of this little, somewhat insignificant spot of land in the yep. Middle East, also, it turns out, happens to be the creator of the entire universe, <laughs> which is really interesting. Okay, so how does that history influence the way Jews behaved in the much larger Hellenized world? Let me say, first of all, that uh, by the time we get to the first century, Jews had been living in the Greek-speaking Western diaspora for three or four centuries. And by living in the Greco-Roman city, they're living within a pagan religious institution. Ancient cities are religious institutions. They're not neutral secular spaces. So anytime in an inscription we have a town councilor or 
and Effie, who would be one of these late adolescent males who are training in a gymnasium to become future citizens. When we see an athlete or an actor, in fact, there were even Jewish gladiators. I can't imagine what their mothers were thinking, but there are Jews all throughout Greek culture. And all of these activities, a town council meeting, would begin with the sacrifice to the gods of the city. An athletic competition is dedicated to the gods of the city. And this is because heaven looks after the earth and you want to have a good relationship with the gods who supervise the city. This is no less true for Jewish citizens of Greek cities than it would be for pagan citizens of Greek cities. So the Jewish God was known to be very peculiar in the Greek mind for demanding that his people not worship other gods. It was considered rude. So what we know is that if these Jews are also part of the Greco-Roman municipal culture, if they're athletes, if they're in the Ephibate, they are somehow present when sacrifices are being offered to the God, but they're not actually doing the sacrifice themselves. Would they bring a tuna fish sandwich from home rather than eat the meat sacrificed to idols? Well, we know from Paul's letters, that's a judgment call. If it doesn't offend another person in the community who's there, go ahead and eat. If you think it would offend somebody in the community, don't eat. One of the interesting things in the Acts of the Apostles that happens is that Paul and one of his missionary companions are mistaken for gods. Paul is attributed to being Hermes because he's doing all the talking, of course, and Zeus, and people want to do a sacrifice in front of them. And they say, no, 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 we're not gods. What's interesting about that story is that that's how real the presence of the gods were to ancient people, so that they could even assume that, that a god is being physically manifest to them. So that's an interesting snapshot of an ancient religious mentality. Speaking of Paul, Professor Fredrickson has a book called Paul, the Pagan's Apostle, and she has a portion of the book in which she talks about how Jews were perceived by their Hellenistic neighbors. She mentions how people noticed that the Jews did not honor other gods, which they concluded was being impious. They were offended that the Jews separated themselves from non-Jews and did not participate in normal activities. The Jews didn't eat pork. People throughout the Greco-Roman world thought circumcision was a gruesome self-mutilation act. Professor Pinhas spoke about this a little bit in last week's episode. During the roundtable talk, Dr. Eli asked a question about how those views of the Jews relate to other quotes that show that the people honored, respected, or looked up to the Jews. So what changed? This is a topic I discuss in my classes as ancient trash talk. And Jews are not singled out for this type of derision. Greco-Roman ethnographers said the exact same things about Egyptians who were considered antisocial and strange. Mm -hmm. They said nasty things about Germans. They said bad things about Celts. They didn't like the Phrygians very much. They were insulting about the Phoenicians. To be an ancient ethnographer, you almost had to not like other ethnic groups very much. And in fact, that's the function of ancient ethnography. We have a disproportionate amount of the anti-Jewish material remaining in the historical record because it was reused by the later Gentile Christian church. Mm -hmm. But it put the, the critical remarks about Jews and Judaism against the wallpaper of ancient ethnographic writing. Greeks and Romans didn't like outsiders, and they said it. Now, somebody who is as nasty and disagreeable as Tacitus, mm -hmm. on the one hand, can say very negative things about Jews and Judaism, and on the other hand, can turn right around in book five of the histories and talk about how the Jews worship the highest God because they worship him Mente sola, with the mind alone, which is a very respectful and positive comment. So sure. it's not like there was an ancient Judaism the way there is a modern anti-Semitism. This is true of any ethnic group. You get positive remarks about the group and negative remarks about the group. And um, it's just 
It's the way that patriotic Greeks and Romans talked about ethnic others. What changes is when you get Gentile Christians reading Jewish documents mm -hmm. in Greek, and that's when, because this is a shock to nobody in your audience, Jewish documents tend to argue with other Jews and say very hostile things about Jews who have a different opinion than the author does. Yeah. And what happens is once you get intra-Jewish argument, Jesus arguing with the Pharisees, Paul arguing with Peter, once you get an intra-Jewish argument read by ethnic outsiders, it becomes an anti-Jewish argument. When you think of the Gospel of Matthew as being a, a Jewish text written for other Jews arguing about, don't be like the Pharisees, be like us, and then you have it read by, by Justin Martyr, it becomes a different text. And those, those inter-Jewish criticisms are used differently. This is a different story. This is what motivates a lot of our courses at IBC. How do we, as a modern reader, begin to hear the Bible from within its own ancient and Jewish context? And if you've been listening to the podcast or taking the IBC courses, I imagine being sensitive to the ancient context is not a new idea to you. I even talked about some of the intra-Jewish arguments with Pinchas Shir right here on the podcast last November. We talked about all the different types of Jewish sects during the Second Temple period. Then in December, I talked with Nicholas Scheiser about learning to hear the Jewishness in the Gospel of Matthew, especially the parts where Western audiences think Jesus is abolishing the Jewish law. These concepts are significant for understanding the reality of what is actually happening in the biblical narrative. But it's also important because, as Dr. Paula Fredrickson just said, once you get a Jewish argument read by an uninformed outsider, it too easily becomes an anti-Jewish argument. And do you remember last week's episode with Professor Shear? What seems like an antagonistic view of Christian versus Jewish ideologies in the letter to the Galatians is actually Paul speaking into the specific context of those Gentile believers in the area of Galatia. So back to this roundtable talk, because there are more things that can be misunderstood by not fully getting the ancient context. Take, for instance, Galatians 2, 11 through 21. Paul refers to an argument he had with Peter in Antioch due to when and where Peter shared a meal or not with Gentile believers. What do we need to know to understand this text better? Christian commentators tend to make up Jewish rules when they don't understand the text that they're reading. And very often, Gentile impurity is conjured to try to explain the fight in Antioch. But the word for Gentile and the word for pagan is the same word in Greek. And when you think that pagans were, had the biggest courtyard in the temple, and we have through inscriptions evidence of pagans all throughout diaspora synagogues, then the, the table fellowship of, of ex-pagan pagans together with Jews in the Christ movement, is not a problem with the human company. It has to be something else. I call this the problem of the menu, the venue, or the seating. It's not a problem with the, um, the menu. In antiquity, for most common meals, uh, people are eating some version of the Mediterranean diet. They're not, you know, it's probably not idle meat that's that issue. It's just too expensive. Wine could be an issue, and if the wife of the household is a Christ follower, but her husband is not, the house would still be filled with representations of family gods and, and municipal gods. It bothered the men from James because they're from Jerusalem, where you don't have the public depiction of foreign gods. Jerusalem is a, is a gods-free zone, by comparison. You don't have statues of other gods all over the place in Jerusalem. Whereas in, in the diaspora, not only are, are Gentiles as pagans going to the synagogue, but Jews as diaspora citizens of their cities are getting naked in the Roman baths with their pagan neighbors. And 
everybody is mixing together. So I think there's a kind of fastidiousness and boundary anxiety on the part of the men from Jerusalem. I think that uh, on the evidence they're wrong. I mean, obviously, there are Jewish teenage boys who are wrestling in the gymnasium, and we have their names on steles that are dedicated to the, the two gods of the gymnasium, Hercules and Hermes. There's a comfortableness mingling with pagans and with their gods on the part of diaspora Jews. But James's men were very uncomfortable. And so Peter goes along with this. And I think the problem is uh, resolved by Gentile Christ followers eating in Jewish Christ followers' homes. And that's the end of the problem. I think also it's fantasy to think that everybody had the same level of kashrut. So the Jewishness has never been uniform. We know it from Josephus, right in Jerusalem, there's Shammai and Hillel, there's, there are the Sadducees, you have the Dead Sea Scroll people, you have all sorts of different interpretations of Jewishness. It's certainly true once you get into the diaspora. And what you get, the problem in Antioch is that we have the proximity of two different kinds of Jewishness, diaspora Jewishness and the men from James. And that's where the issue lies. This is all so good and so exciting, right? There's just so much to learn. Thank you for joining me this week as we heard from Dr. Paula Fredrickson. Full access to this and other roundtable talks are available to you when you sign up for Israel Bible Center's certificate program in Jewish context and culture. Click on the link in the notes at the bottom of this episode, and it will only take you three minutes, if even three, to enroll in the program. Thank you to Jeremy McDonald with Mason Jar Music for mixing, editing, and crafting all the good sounds that you hear. And thank you for being curious about the world of the Bible. Bible.